We added a lot of animals in episode six, and then the next day, it was already time for a whole bunch of upgrades. I'm Matthew, your BRS beginner guru, and let's start with the flow. We need a lot of flow, but not your typical flow. We need strong, random flow that more closely resembles an actual reef. I don't want the typical one directional flow that you usually see in saltwater aquariums of this size. Why would that be? Well, because a couple things will happen. First, the corals will develop lopsided growth because the flow is only going to be hitting them from one side. And second, we're just going to get dead spots if we do it that way where a whole bunch of extra food and fish waste collects. But I have a somewhat radical plan that I'm sure many of you seasoned hobbyists will think is overkill, but I have implemented it and been using it for over a couple weeks. And I must say, it is going very well. The first First upgrade is the two included return nozzles. Let me be clear, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the flared return nozzles included with the JBJ RF45. But in my hunt for more randomized flow, I'm going to swap them out with these two random flow generators. I don't pretend to understand at all how exactly it works, but a few years ago I spoke with the owner and he told me it was all to do with fluid dynamics. Given the recommended amount of flow, water is constantly pushed past the patented internal wing-like structures and out the nozzle constantly and randomly changing directions. These are super easy to install, but just make sure you get the one half inch lock line size. To replace the flared nozzles, start by pulling them off. They'll be attached like this. To remove the flared nozzle, simply bend it to the side and it will pop off. Then simply push the random flow generator onto the now empty lock line and point it downward so the flow goes into the water not on the surface. If yours looks like this, it's pointed too far up. Just remove it, adjust it downward, and reinstall it. Obviously, repeat the process for the other nozzle, and the first flow upgrade is complete. Now it's time to install our two wave makers. I am a huge fan of the laminar sheet-like flow from the gyre pumps. And luckily for us, Aqua Illumination has worked with MaxSpect to bring us the Orbit 2, which will pair with the Mobius app. And this will be really important to dial in and schedule our flow, as you will see shortly. The Orbit 2 can be mounted either horizontally or vertically, and each side of the pump can be rotated to direct the flow in whatever direction you want. On top of all of this, we can program each Orbit 2 independently to create crazy amounts of randomized flow. Mounting the AI Orbits is super easy. I'm going to place each one on the opposite sides of the tank, about one and a half inches below the water line, with the exterior magnets securing the pumps into place. As soon as you plug them in, they are going to turn on to somewhere near high, which will be way too much flow and will start kicking up sand in the tank. Not to worry, this sandstorm will be short-lived because we are about to program both pumps and dial in the flow. I have three goals I am trying to accomplish with the Orbit 2 wave makers in the JBJ RF45. First, I want to schedule my flow so that it's more calm at night, ramps up through midday, and then returns to calm again at night. Second, since the Orbit 2s can actually operate in reverse, I want to have designated times throughout the day where the pumps are going in the same direction to help clean out any dead spots. Third, I want to utilize the random flow settings of each pump so that both pumps will meet in the middle and create a whole bunch of randomized and turbulent flow. I played around with the settings in the mode app for several hours and I finally came up with a schedule that I am absolutely thrilled with. I am going to walk you through the settings so that you can copy them with the schedule for the left wave maker on the left side of the screen and the right wave maker on the right side. Starting out from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m., both pumps are at their most calm 
random flow with a minimum speed of 5% and a max of 10%. From 6 to 7 a.m., left pump is 10 to 15% forward with the right pump 70 to 90% in reverse. This will create a clockwise flow pattern that will clear out any dead spots on the right side of the tank. From 7 to 9 a.m., left pump is 10 to 25% forward with the same for the right pump. We are ramping up our flow strength as the morning progresses. Remember, my tank day starts with the lights on at 7 a.m. and lights out at 5 p.m. So if your light schedule is different, you'll need to adjust the flow schedule to match. From 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., we are going to switch the flow to a counterclockwise direction with the left pump 70 to 90% in reverse and the right pump 10 to 25% forward. From 10 a.m. to noon, we are finally at full strength with both pumps at 30 to 50% forward random. From noon to 1 p.m., we return to a clockwise flow pattern with the left pump forward from 30 to 50% and the right pump 70 to 90% in reverse. From 1 to 3 p.m., another two-hour bout of full-strength turbulence with both pumps set to 30 to 50% forward. From 3 to 4 p.m. is our last round of counterclockwise flow for the day with the left pump 70 to 90% reverse and and the right pump 20 to 35% forward. You'll notice the right pump flow is a little bit less because we're nearing the end of our day, so we're trying to ramp things slowly down. From 4 to 6 p.m., both pumps are set to 20 to 30% forward, and then from 6 to 7 p.m., we slow things down even more to 10 to 20% for both pumps. I've been running this schedule for two weeks now in the RF45, and I must say I am extremely happy with the results. No dead spots no sandstorms, and the Gorgonians look really happy and healthy. But before finishing with flow, we need to update our feed timer to include the two orbits as well. To do this, from the Mobius tank home screen, click on the ellipses on the upper right, then click edit scene, then click feed mode, and then click on orbit. Set both pumps to 1% forward and click done. The feed mode will now activate for one hour with both return pumps and both wave makers turned all the way down to 1%. Okay, well, I know we have already adjusted the lights once. We turned them way down to avoid nuisance algae growth, but now we need to turn them up to provide enough light for our photosynthetic gorgonians as well as the few anemones that have already made their way into the tank. I started by trying to create a custom schedule because I thought the Hello Reef template on this tank looked a little bit too blue for me, but after playing around with it for several hours, I ended up realizing that the Hello Reef preset was the best, so that's what I went with. My biggest concern with doing so is that because I have two lights on this tank, that the intensity would be too much for our corals. So to dial those in, I broke out my fancy PAR meter, which measures the intensity of the lights. These PAR meters are absolutely fantastic tools, but you only need them once when originally setting up your tank, so it doesn't make a lot of sense for people to purchase. Rather, what you can do is copy someone who has the same setup as you, or oftentimes you can borrow a PAR meter from a local aquarium club, your local fish store, or a friend if they have one. Since I know my anemones are thriving in the Hello Reef tank, I wanted to match the light intensity, which would be around 125 par near the sand bed and 250 to 300 near the middle of the tank. And lo and behold, the base Hello Reef setting at 100%, even with the two AI blade lights, almost perfectly matches the par readings of the Hello Reef tank. So I just let it be because I know my anemones are super happy with that intensity, so I figure they will also do well in this tank. So so if you want to copy my settings and have a par level of about 150 down here and 250 to 300 in the middle, all you need to do is use the Hello Reef preset, which is already set to 100%. With the lights dialed in much quicker than I thought they would be, I am gonna add a piece of gear that I absolutely swear by. But I will admit, it's certainly not a common piece of gear, especially in 45 gallon rear filtration tanks like this one. So what is that piece of gear? 
It's a UV sterilizer. There are a few sterilizer options to choose from, but I have used this hang on the back 8 watt version in several different tanks, and it happens to be one of my keys to anemone success. A UV sterilizer is simply a black tube with a UV light inside. Tank water is pumped in from the bottom, passes by the UV light, and is returned to the tank through the top here. A UV sterilizer emits a certain wavelength of light that will alter and disrupt DNA and RNA, causing various bacteria, algae, and protozoa to no longer be able to reproduce. So while it doesn't kill those things, it has the same effect by not allowing them to reproduce. But it's important to note that a UV sterilizer only works for things that are in the water column that are actually pass through and come into contact with the UV light. So whatever pests live on your sand bed or your rock work aren't going to be affected unless they are pulled off or somehow disturbed and pass through the UV sterilizer. On top of that, you need to make sure you dial in the right amount of flow because all of those pests and bacteria will only have their DNA and RNA damaged if they are exposed to enough UV light. So if the flow is way too fast, then they will go through the sterilizer too quickly and their DNA and RNA won't be damaged. So getting the right amount of flow is absolutely crucial. You may be wondering, Matthew, why are you even using a UV sterilizer? Well, for me, it's a preventative measure and I've just found I have way more success, especially at keeping things like dinoflagellates and cyanobacteria at bay. And who knows, it may help with other things as well. To install one yourself, you will need the eight watt aqua UV sterilizer, one half inch silicone tubing, two hose clamps, and a small pump, which for me is the DC powered AI Axis 40. Installation is quite easy. Start by pushing the flexible silicone tubing onto the barbed pumped input and secure it with a plastic hose clamp. Then place the pump into the rear filtration chamber. Oh, and by the way, I'm using silicone tubing and a DC powered pump, not because I have to, but because when used in combination, I have found there to be almost no vibration noise and you should all be aware by this point how much vibrating pumps annoy me. If you want to save a few bucks, absolutely you can just use standard flexible tubing and a AC powered return pump. Something like the CJ Synchra Silent 1.5 would work just fine. Now use a pair of sharp scissors to cut the silicone tubing to the correct size and attach it to the barbed sterilizer input nozzle and secure it with a plastic hose clamp. With the silicone tubing attached to the pump. Now we want to hang the sterilizer over the back edge of the tank and into the rear filtration chamber, preferably a different compartment than the pump since we don't just want to keep recirculating the same water through the sterilizer. To operate the sterilizer, we need to turn on the UV bulb as well as the pump. You're probably aware of this by now, but my Wi-Fi outlet is packed and I don't have any more space to put things but I still want to be able to control these items during my weekly water change, so I've come up with a simple solution. I purchased several of these foot-long splitters, and if you take a look at my Wi-Fi strip setup, you'll notice I have various things grouped together. Both of my return bumps are on one outlet, both wave makers on another, and now I'm going to attach both the UV bulb and pump to the same outlet as well. This will allow me to control every piece of gear I need to easily for my weekly water change. With the UV sterilizer and pump plugged in, I'm going to dial back the Access 40 pump in the Mobius app. Just go through the regular steps for adding a new device, and then I'm going to set the pump to a constant speed at 35% and I'm done. UV sterilizer maintenance only needs to be done about once every six months, and I will show you how to do that in a future episode. With the UV sterilizer turned on, you will likely notice there is a lot of splashing in the rear filtration chamber. That splashing is super annoying because you're gonna get salt water over everything, but I have what I think is an original and somewhat genius solution, so just stand by. If you remember from last episode, we have started a rather heavy feeding 
heating schedule in our tank. And because of that, I have had to water test every single day because I know from experience that my nitrate, but especially my phosphate, can easily and quickly get out of whack. Well, after a couple weeks of testing, only one of those water parameters actually had an issue. Take a peek at my water testing journal. For some reason, my nitrate levels have managed themselves nicely. I'm thinking it's because my deeper than usual sand bed, which in the rear right of the tank is almost three inches. I can't prove it, but anaerobic bacteria, the kind of bacteria that converts nitrate to nitrogen gas, thrives only in low oxygen environments, and that would probably be the only place in my tank where that environment exists. I can't prove it, obviously, so I would say it's an educated guess at best. The phosphates, on the other hand, I have had to take a more aggressive approach with. On December 13th, my phosphate climbed to 0.15 parts per million, which is the absolute upper limit I run my tanks at. And since I knew the phosphate would just climb higher, I started dosing three teaspoons of granular ferric oxide, GFO. It did help for a few days, but then the phosphate dropped to zero, which we absolutely do not want. That was on December 14th, but I didn't panic. I knew from experience that because of how much I was feeding, those phosphate levels would come right back up. The most important thing to remember about the first few weeks after adding animals is you are going to experience a roller coaster in the tank, and that's completely normal. Our animals are adjusting, our macroalgae are starting to grow, and we're trying to dial in the right feeding schedule. The trick during this time is just to not let your nitrate or phosphates get too high or too low. Right before Christmas, I started seeing some stability in my tank, but I did have to jack up my GFO from three teaspoons to five and a half teaspoons. But you have to be really conservative and careful when using GFO because it works so well that you can easily bottom out your phosphate levels and that can lead to a dinoflagellate outbreak, a cyanobacteria outbreak, and brittle coral skeletons, which leads to unhealthy and little coral growth. So if you're running GFO, start out very slowly test the following day, and if you still need to add more, then you can add more. On top of adding granulopheric oxide to the tank, I also add activated carbon in every week, and that happens to be one of my secrets to anemone success. Carbon removes toxins from the water, as well as colors and smells, so I change out the carbon each week during the water change. But Matthew, how do you dose both of these? I've come up with a method that works so well, and I think I'm the first one to discover it. Okay, I'm probably not, but I've never seen anybody else do it, so I'm gonna claim this as mine. I take one of these three by eight inch extra fine media bags that I picked up on Amazon, add the media inside, rinse it well with tap water, then hang it over the UV sterilizer using the perfectly sized knob on the top. I think this is almost as good as using a media reactor because so much flow will be going through the media bag from the output of the UV sterilizer. The only downside I have found is the flow is a little bit too strong for the activated carbon. So over time, those carbon pellets can actually break down a little bit. So I only put the output of the UV sterilizer in one of the two compartments that has a sponge at the bottom. What I've noticed then is instead of that activated carbon that does happen to break down, it gets caught in the sponge, and then every few weeks during a water change, I can just remove the sponge and rinse it. Not only does this make the GFO and carbon run more efficiently, but by using the bag over the output, it actually completely stops all of that splashing, which is a huge bonus. And then every week during my water change, I simply remove the media, add in fresh media, and put it back on the sterilizer. The other element I have been testing for frequently is alkalinity, and alkalinity actually isn't an element, it is the measure of the buffering capacity of water. For me, this one is the easiest to manage because I simply need to either increase or decrease the amount of Kalkwasser I'm adding to the auto top off reservoir. My goal is always to keep the number somewhere between 7 and 12 dKH, but ideally, I I'd prefer something closer to 8 to 11, with 9 being the sweet spot. I've had to ramp up the Kalkwasser level to 8 teaspoons in my 10-gallon reservoir, but 
I'm gonna have to keep an eye on my alkalinity every week because as the evaporation level changes or as my corals grow, they may consume more or less, so I will have to make adjustments as I go along. You can see here in my journal, the alkalinity has creeped up to around 11, and that's getting a bit high for me, but I think it's gonna stabilize around there, so I'm not gonna mess with the Kalkwasser dosing at this level. But when it's time to replace the auto top off for reservoir with fresh RODI water, I will likely scale back the Kalkwasser just a bit. With the gear installed and the water parameters starting to even out, it is time to show you step by step everything I do for my weekly water change and that is coming up in episode 8. Click here for the entire beginner playlist and until next time, be well and happy reefing everybody.